So today I'm going to talk about why the climate itself can make climate change communication uh, difficult and uh, I'm calling this sort of a presentation in two acts because I've added something to the original plan and so the two parts are a little bit different from one another and hopefully you'll see why I've connected them. If not, maybe I'm a bit crazy. Um, we've already talked a little bit today about, uh, Hunter Cutting talked about it this morning, about how the climate variability has influenced uh, public opinion about weather in the U.S. over the past few years. This is just a photo from the uh, Coney Island during the heat wave last year in the U.S. It was the warmest year in U.S. history. It's an article talking about all the stories in, in, the news, in newspapers and magazines talking about the connection, possible connections to climate change. And so it's funny because we had actually just published uh, earlier this year, we'd already finished the study and we're just doing revisions on it when the heat wave happened last year asking this exact question. And we did it using data going back over 20 years, basically as long as there was uh, polling in the U.S. about climate change. We took polling data from uh, four of the ma major organizations. The Gallup has the longest, most consistent sort of time series available. And we compared them with monthly mean temperatures for the U.S., so for the continental U.S. We also did it for regions of the U.S., but we've mostly focused on the national. And so we plucked out uh, questions that were reasonably consistent between the different polling agencies, and we analyzed their relationship, the answers, the relationship of the answers to the climate variability for each polling agency, and then we also did it as a, as a composite as well. And you found pretty much the same results, whether we looked at the Gallup data, which had the longest time series, or whether you looked at the um, sort of composite made of all the different polls. And the result was that basically belief in global warming, or, or in the fact that the Earth is warming, um, increases when the last 12 months have been warm. And in fact, you, can do, you find the analysis when you use different temperature lags, the so last three months, last six months, last nine months. Really key thing here is that we're using kind of the same concept you use in so much of uh, scientific and biological research, which is using sort of a accumulated heat stress, basically saying that it, don't just look at this today's temperatures necessarily, which there's other studies that have shown a relationship for, but saying that the accumulation over time does seem to have an influence. The second question that was most common across the polls that we sort of focused on was something of variant that varied on how much do you worry about climate, global warming or climate change. And again, showing you the results from the Gallup poll, this was the one where the statistical significance was even stronger. The previous one was significant um, for all the different types of analyses we did. This one was actually stronger where you find that for each one degree Celsius, Canadian, so we're speaking in Celsius, um, increase in temperature, there's about a 10 point swing in how much people worry about climate change, so it's much more measurable. Now, of course, this is polling data. They're done once a year at most, so we don't have that many data points, right? And so there's a lot of other possible explanatory variables. So what we did to sort of back this up is we looked at another way we could measure opinion, right? So maybe we just found a correlation here. And so we looked at op-ed pieces in newspapers, and this was the part of the study that took a lot longer, uh, to be honest. So we looked at opinion articles and what attitude they expressed about what we sort of termed as the expert consensus on climate change. Either that um, climate change is real and, and driven by human activity, or that it is just a prominent public concern. Nothing about what action should be taken, just it's something that we should be worried about. And we did this um, over the same 20-year uh, period, uh, and we picked five newspapers, and in, I can go uh, later if anyone has questions about why we picked those five. Um, so it was over 2,000 op-ed pieces, and this is where I really have to thank Jeremy McDaniels, the student I worked with, because we came up with a coding matrix, worked on this together, tested it, but then he actually read all 2,160 op-ed pieces. And for those of you out here that read American newspapers quite frequently, it was not fun. <laughs> right? And so this is just a, a sense of the reporting, and we've all the data I'm showing you, we've done all these tests to see, did it change over time because there's more, more op-ed pieces about climate change and everything. So we've controlled for all of that in doing the analysis. And we found that the media opinions react to the climate variability very similarly to the actual public opinion in polls does. And so this is sort of one summary graph I'll show you showing the fraction of articles that were, um, that agreed with our consensus versus the fraction that disagreed. Overall, if you took the whole time series, you'd have about, it was about two thirds that agreed, about 20% that disagreed, and then a small fraction that we dis we basically classified as um, agnostic, that you just could not tell from the article what the stance was. Uh, and so the interesting findings you can pull out from this is, first of all, just sort of the numbers. Every percent increase in agree, um, uh, every, every degree Celsius went, resulted in about a seven point bump in the percent that agree. 
Um, we also found that if you analyze these seasonally, so the nice thing about doing the op-ed data is because there's so many op-eds, we were analyze, able to analyze these by month and also by season. And what we found is the one season in which there wasn't uh, a relationship was the fall, which isn't that surprising if you think about all the other things that would affect why somebody would write an op-ed piece in a newspaper in the fall. That's when Congress is back in session. That's when all the UN uh, climate uh, negotiations are. So it was kind of a, a loose hypothesis we went in with. Um, in terms of the individual newspapers, we found significant relationships only for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Part of that is because they have so many more op-eds that it was easier to detect a relationship. But it's interesting, we found them in both papers, even though they're on opposite sides of sort of the editorials, the political spectrum. Uh, and the last thing to point out was that from, uh, if you compare fall 2009 to the seasons afterwards, there was a significant de decrease right after fall 2009 in the percent degree, which probably has to do with climate gate. Now, we can't say that necessarily influenced public opinion, as we talked about in the morning, but it certainly influenced what was being written in newspapers. Um, what does all this mean? Does this mean climate is affecting attitudes on climate change for sure? You know, what's really clear is the arrow up there is not necessarily fixed. It's going to vary over time, and it's not necessarily direct. Um, the first thing is that climate variability is obviously only one of many drivers of people's attitudes about climate change, and separating, the effect, separating out the effects of other factors from these sort of time series is pretty difficult. We could do it, we did a little bit of work with it, we can't really divide it up and give you percentages for all of the, all the different influences. Um, the other thing is to take in mind that the effect of the climate on, um, on opinion polls might be indirect. We talked about this a little bit earlier today, but it really, what might be happening here is people responding more to the overall discourse than to their actual experience with the climate, which is why the nationally average temperature um, can affect polls, uh, can affect the results, as can just using the northeastern U.S. temperatures. We tied that as well, had a very similar relationships to nationally averaged um, public opinion data because that's where most of the, the news media is, is located. Um, and also to keep in mind that the variance here that we're talking about is reasonably small and the swings we're probably seeing are effectively what we might consider climate change swing voters or people in the middle of those, the six Americas spectrum. Now, the, nevertheless, I think one thing that I, I, we got out of this because of having personally looked through so many of the op-ed pieces, realized that sometimes scientists contribute to this problem because we write op-eds during, during or, or push to see them published when there's a heat wave, not when it's cold outside. And, um, you know, so one thing you could do is just talk about other parts of the world where it is hot outside. And so I work in, uh, I do field work in Kiribati, which is in the central equatorial Pacific. It's one of the lowest lying countries in the world. Uh, about 100,000 people live there. Most of the land is less than two meters above the sea level. And, um, uh, and I'll say, yeah, I do coral reef research there, so I do go diving, and it's not a vacation, and I usually want to have to talk about Kiribati and make sure people take me seriously. We are not going on holidays when, when I'm there. What is scrolling underneath is just a list of things that has happened to me over the past <laughs> six years that I've been in Kiribati, um, pretty much every year. Um, it's a wonderful place, but it's not an easy place to work. Um, but we've learned, I've learned a lot from being there about how these problems about uh, climate variability versus climate change exist even in the places we think are the most vulnerable in the world. And so you need to take it into account. Uh, this is a photo of Tarawa, the capital of Kiribati, from the ocean, from out in a boat. Um, you can't actually see it. A person in Kiribati that's used to being out in a boat and fishing could see it because you look for the reflection of the lagoon, which is quite green, in the clouds. Um, it's a bit hard to make out in the photo if you had polarized sunglasses on, it's a little bit easier. But this is what people worry about, about Kiribati. They worry about slowly over time it's going to disappear as sea levels rise and it's going to, the islands are going to erode away and all that will be left will be this view. Now the reality is actually a lot more complicated. Kiribati is under serious long-term threat from climate change, but there's variability there. This is a, a more vis easier to see picture of Tarawa. There's variability even in Kiribati. This is the uh, monthly sea level data from the tide gauge in, in, um, in uh, Tarawa. Uh, if, you put, if, if I combine the data from a previous tide gauge and corrected for it, you'd see the trend more clearly. But looking over just the period since this more recent Australian tide gauge, tidal facility gauge has been put in, it's hard to see the trend. Statistically speaking, there is one there, but the variability is huge. Kiribati is a bit unique, it's influenced by El Nino events, so the sea level goes up and down with El Nino cycle. And that circle I'm showing you there is between the uh, 97 El Nino event and the 98 La Nina event, where there was almost a half meter difference in sea level. 
right? And that's just averaged monthly, not taking tides or anything into account, right? So there's big variability, right? And so if you show up in Kiribati and you're a journalist and you go there at the right time, you can definitely see something that looks like climate change, right? That looks like sea level rise. This is a photo I took uh, during my actual first visit. Ironically, I was there at the highest point they've had in sea level since I, um, since I started working there, happened on my first visit. And it was just a complete fluke. I didn't plan it. Uh, and so this is a photo of a, um, a house that uh, the beach uh, at sort of medium tide is normally about where the wall is, right? And so the, the winds have evicted a lot of the water up, the water level is very high, sea erosion. And if you look in the tidal data, the circle is, what I'm sh is, is this event that I'm showing you here. The previous event, uh, high tide, that happened during that El Nino event, broke three meters on their tide gauge, that's the highest since. So there has not been a higher mark on the tide gauge since. Um, and if you type Kiribati and sea level rise into Google, that's what you'll see. These photos of that event are on a Greenpeace website, right? And so it's showing this is sea level rise, this is what's happening in Caribbean. Now, there's also, there's not just variability, there's also human modification. So when we think of like the urban heat island effect affecting temperatures, well, there's kind of like an urban heat island effect going on in most atoll countries because there's so little land, people do what they can to recapture land. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. You build a causeway between two islands, it changes the sediment flow. A lot more of that sediment actually builds up along the edges of the causeway, you actually end up inadvertently getting more land. And so if you look at photos of Bairiki, the little islet that I took this photo from, so we're looking away from Bairiki, the, um, the black thick line there is Bairiki from a recent aerial photo. The old one is an aerial photo from about 50 years ago. So despite sea level rise, Bairiki is bigger than it used to be. It might not be higher than it used to be, but it is bigger, right? And so when this news comes out, there's headlines all over the world. Pacific Islands growing, not shrinking due to climate change, right? Um, and the authors of that paper, I know them quite well, I know Arthur Webb quite well. This was not what he expected, how he expected people to respond. This was not the conclusion of their paper, but obviously it is, it is how people took it. Uh, there's a complex set of factors at play, right? Articles like this are, are, appear every couple months. I get lots of phone calls from journalists about Kiribati. But what's going on? We have journalists and activists that want to go to a place like this to see sea level rise, right? They might not have any experience with the region or the culture, right? And you might go with existing ideas of these poor, isolated islanders that are vulnerable and can't do anything about this problem, which is generally not the case. There's also the lack of local capacity to sort of process what people are being told by the international community. We tell them, your country's in trouble, so every time people there see flooding event, they think it's climate change, right? And the government, at the same time, needs to publicize the threat of climate change because it is long-term a very serious concern, right? You combine that with the fact that there's money available for climate change aid, and it can look like the Kiribati government is ginning up things just to, just to get money. And so what happens when stories like this are published are a lot of problems. This story, that photo, that village that um, is eroded away, that village is not, did not erode away because of climate change. That particular village eroded away because 150 years ago it was built on a sand spit. They didn't realize it. And even the people in the village know it. But unfortunately, if you visit Kiribati, somebody will take you to that village and tell you this thing's been disappearing because of climate change. And so good intentions and poor research end up inadvertently supporting some skepticism about sea level rise, but also support skepticism about Kiribati and about the government, which causes real problems there. And so um, I had a, that quote I showed at the beginning was actually from an article in 1988, in 1989, written by Steve Schneider, Schneider about what then was the warmest year in, in US history, 1988. And, and Steve had written that, you know, he was basically worried that if uh, we focus too much on publicizing the heat waves, right, that we could lose the momentum of public, you know, every time there is a cold year, then we could lose the momentum of public interest and lose some of our credibility as well. Now, we've learned a lot today and throughout this week about how important it is to focus on extreme events because they mean something to people. We just need to be a little bit careful in the way we do it. And so what I'd encourage is that Keep talking, keep writing op-eds, even when there is no local heat wave. The planet is warming. We were talking about this earlier this week. There's going to be a story to tell somewhere, right? There's always somewhere on the planet that's having some, there, there, where there are records being broken, right? The trick with that, though, is be careful, 
when you're reporting about develop, particularly about developing countries, especially remote places like Kiribati, because you're, um, we end up being much looser with our attribution when we're talking about a place we don't know, and that can do real harm to the people back there. Uh, and for more about this, the, the, the public opinion research is actually in a paper is out in climatic change. And if you're interested in more of these stories about Kiribati, the paper from EOS uh, can tell you a bit about that. So, thanks.